Yes. Thank, you very much. Thank you, Nicole. So we welcome you at Arden Conversation Extra Talk. We'll be talking about predicting aesthetic experience today. We will discuss psychological mechanisms which underlie aesthetic judgments, and we will also discuss models we can build to predict these judgments. As usual, we have two speakers um, which are going to approach this topic from different perspectives, but both speakers are artists and scientists at the same time, which is particular about this seminar today. Um, so I'll just remind you that first we will listen to their talks and after that we'll have a discussion. So during the discussion everyone will have a chance to ask a question or maybe comment something. So please write down if you have any questions you'll have a chance to ask them. Um, so our first speaker today is Anna Clemente. Dr. Clemente is a postdoctoral researcher at the Institute of Neurosciences, University of Barcelona, and since February 2020, she is a visiting researcher at the Music Cognition Lab at Queen Mary University of London. Dr. Clemente was awarded a PhD in Human Evolution and Cognition at the University of the Balearic Islands. She is both a cognitive scientist and a professional musician. As a musician, Dr. Clemente has worked with many leading figures such as Claudio Abado and Berliner Philharmonic Wind Quintet. In her research, she combines her artistic and scientific background at the same time. Her main research interests involve neuroaesthetics, music cognition and the concept of aesthetic sensitivity. Uh, Dr. Clemente, thank you very much for accepting uh, our invitation. We look forward for your talk. Thank you. Please feel free to share your screen whenever you're ready. Thanks so much. Thanks for this uh, very nice introduction. I'm going to try to share my screen. Uh, OK. So this is the one. I hope you are now. Yes, we can see my screen. OK, perfect. So good afternoon, everyone. And thanks so much again, Nicola and Marina, for inviting me to take part in this wonderful event. And thank you, Anne, for agreeing to share stage and ideas. And of course, thank you for bringing yourselves to this seminar. So welcome to the question that brings us here. Is aesthetic experience predictable? Well, this is a tricky one, and in my view, of paramount relevance to several fields, including but not restricted to empirical aesthetics and art. Aesthetic experience can be defined as the pleasure that we get in perceiving sensory objects, which makes us value things, value objects as more or less wanted, liked, and this is what I, um, what I say is to assign hedonic value to them. So I'll focus on predicting hedonic value rather than on predicting aesthetic experience itself. I hope to clarify the operation behind this uh, nuance throughout this presentation. So this approach will allow me to address the question of why we like what we like, from which I reflect on art and aesthetics from a transdisciplinary perspective. So let's start with the question, is hedonic value predictable? Humans, like other cognitive systems, are sensitive to the environment. We rely on sensory information to guide our behavior, to be in the world. We seek out and engage in behaviors that lead to positive or rewarding outcomes. In the same way, we avoid those that yield negative or cognitive consequences. In other words, our choices and actions are motivated by the pleasure that we expect and or we obtain from them. So the ability to judge the external, the external world as desirable or, or avoidable, liked or disliked, beneficial or damaging, enables comparing, deciding and prioritizing actions. Moreover, we build our knowledge of the world based on how much we like the elements of the environment. And we do it by learning and generating expectations about them. The evaluation of sensory objects is therefore a fundamental aspect of cognition and crucial for survival. For millennia, philosophers and scientists have pursued a common goal. They have striven to identify laws between object properties and the pleasure of perceiving them. The idea that preference emanates from the object dates back to classical philosophical thinking. So, for example, the Pythagorean school held that the aesthetic value of any object resides in the harmonious arrangement and the proportion among its parts. Likewise, properties such as symmetry, balance, or the golden ratio have been deemed determinants of aesthetic pleasure. This tradition of thought assumes that hedonic value is consubstantial to the object, as it is embodied in the object's features, and that such features predictably elicit aesthetic responses such as beauty, liking, or delight. 
The current epitome of this tradition is a study recently published in Nature mm -hmm. Human Behavior. So I interrupt, Anna. I think that for some reason I see your presentation slightly cut on the left. Would you mind trying to share your screen again? Because I think with the images. Uh, yeah. Uh, I'm sorry about that. Um, I didn't notice that. OK, oh, so I'm no. I stopped sharing. I, no, no. I start sharing again. OK, so let me start sharing again. Um, So can you see that now? Yeah, that's perfect. Thank you so much. OK, uh, so yeah. So I said that uh, the, uh, the current epitome of this tradition is uh, a very recent uh, study published in Nature Human Behavior, in which uh, the authors state that preferences can be predicted from stimulus features. Sorry, and this yeah. is remarkable. Sorry? Sorry, Anna, whatever you did a second ago, it just went back to being cut. So I don't know if you, I, I just wanted to, yes. OK, so if you leave it like this, we see the whole slide. OK, sorry about that. No, it's OK. Thank you. Sorry to interrupt. OK, so um, yeah, I was saying that um, this, this is remarkable because it shows that not only uh, this tradition, is alive, but actually that actually it constitutes the mainstream in behavioral sciences. But if they were right, why do we have such different and changing state tastes regarding the same objects? So why do we love what others hate and the other way around? Or how is it possible that we like something that we disliked in the past or vice versa? So, the stimulus properties alone suffice to explain why we like what we like. Indeed, these theories and the assumption on which they rely have not held up to empirical scrutiny. For instance, symmetry is not universally liked. It depends on expertise and personality. Likewise, the draw review of the century of psychological research on the golden section showed that it reflects statistical aggregations, not individual preferences. In these, these, indeed, this and many other studies have shown that it's a mistake to assume that general trends imply uniformity or inform about any universal laws. Actually, they mask a remarkable variation in hedonic sensitivity, that is, in the role that object properties play in their hedonic evaluation. Each individual brings a unique background to the assessment of the stimulus, which makes them hedonically sensitive or insensitive to a particular feature to a particular extent. Furthermore, the evaluation itself is not alien to the particular situation in which it takes place. Hence the dictum de gustibus non disputandum est. One cause of these differences is that brains are inherently different, obeying to genetic, developmental, or experiential causes. Consequently, the processes underlying the evaluation also vary. And examining such processes at the individual level is key to understanding the underlying mechanisms. Fortunately, neuroscience has substantially contributed in this regard. For instance, the connectivity between sensory areas and the reward system explains a considerable variability in the pleasure that we get from stimuli like music. In fact, sensory information that doesn't, does, that doesn't reach the reward system fails to acquire hedonic value, as it is the case in specific musical anatomia, the inability to experience pleasure from music. In the same way that individual differences lead to variations in hedonic value between people, how the assessment is articulated models the hedonic value according to the circumstances. And another reason why people respond to sensory features in different ways is that hedonic evaluations are sensitive to the context. So physical entities that are relevant to uh, survival are statistically associated with specific sensory properties. But despite being true as a basic principle for establishing preferences, this is also insufficient to explain why our taste varies. Indeed, most cognitive systems develop mechanisms that allow them to consider also other relevant information, which refers to the system state needs, goals, and expectations, and also to the conditions in which the behavior occurs. 
And that's why, for example, guppies prefer previously rejected male if they see other females pursuing him. So expectations, physiology, and environmental conditions influence the hedonic valuation of a stimulus. They affect how the perceptual, cognitive, and emotional systems involved in the evaluation act upon it. So for instance, when we are hungry, eating something sweet is usually very pleasant. As we get satiated, the pleasure of eating decreases even to the point of rejection. And another factor, which is very important in, uh, uh, for this uh, evalu evaluative process is previous experience. It's responsible for differences in taste between people, but also between different times in the same individual. Neuroimaging experiments have found that the engagement with the stimulus not only affects how it is represented by sensory systems, but also modulates expectations for how rewarding it will be, as manifested in, by variation in how reward pred prediction signals arise in response to sensory cues. So, for example, when confronted with a face, the human brain computes how attractive it finds it, regardless of whether the individual is engaged in an explicit evaluation task or not. However, the neural activity um, associated with explicit and implicit evaluations are markedly different, especially in reward structures such as the nucleus accumbens, the insula, and the orbitofrontal orbit cortex. And similarly, when people are asked to assess their preference for objects belonging to different categories, reward activity correlating with each category is modulated by different base, baseline levels that reflect expectations based on prior experience. In summary, the evaluation of sensory objects involves assigning hedonic value to a stimulus based on its sensory properties combined with personal and contextual factors. Hedonic values are responses to projections from sensory systems to distributed nuclei in the reward system, motivated by input from both the interceptive and the executive systems. A wealth of empirical evidence suggests that the hedonic value of an object is not immanent to it. It can not be predicted solely on the basis of its features. Instead, it depends on the individual neurobiology and the computational resources involved in the evaluation. This doesn't imply that hedonic valuations are arbitrary. Instead, the brain's evaluative mechanisms have evolved to provide flexible responses pertinent to an ever-changing environment. In such a world, the same stimulus can be of value in one situation and a possible detriment in another and beneficial for one individual but damaging for another individual. Therefore, evaluative systems are adaptive. They are not normative. They serve survival much better if they are able to predict the value of an object for a particular individual in a specific situation. So to understand the so-called aesthetic experience or the pleasure that we get in perceiving, psychology and neuroscience must treat the evaluative system as a complex organization of computational nodes that interact dynamically. The central scientific challenge, to my view, is to understand how perceptual, cognitive, emotional, interceptive, and executive processes come together in different circumstances. But all of this is not to say that object features play no role in their evaluation or that the mechanistic account of hedonic valuation is not possible. On the contrary, the mechanistic account of pleasure in perception is well in reach of the brain and behavioral sciences, but it'd be wholly inadequate if it disregarded the agent and its context. In the wording that makes the title of this seminar, predicting aesthetic experience is indeed possible, but not trivial or simple. On the contrary, the complexity that I've briefly portrayed here constitutes its very essence. Perception is not a mere passive recording of object features. It's the means by which an active cognitive system attempts to make sense of the world. And it does so by continually evaluating the experience, goals, and expectations associated with the object's features. The eye of the beholder is never naive. We perceive and evaluate the world through an individual and situated lens. The lens of our experience, our knowledge, interests, needs, goals, and expectations. We like what we like because we are who we are here and now. And this brings to a discussion, this brings us to a discussion of very important relevance, very, very 
great relevance in, in art and, and, and science. First and foremost, artistic value and aesthetic value are not the same, not, nor even equivalent evaluations, in the same way that art and aesthetics are not synonymous or refer to the same construct. However, they appear intertwined in most artistic and scientific literature and practice. Why so? To understand this conundrum, let's briefly revise the origin and development of the idea of aesthetic experience, which existed before psychology and modern new science. The concept of aesthetic experience was forged out of interests and related to the scientific understanding of the human brain, cognition or behavior. Instead, it emerged from social transformations in the 18th century Europe that privileged art and the wealthy, the philosophical discourse of the truth of judgments and the appropriation of how such judgments ought to be to characterize how experiences are to promote that art has no value in itself, but with taste or aesthetic sensitivity as an indicator of social status. With the advance of psychology in the 19th century, aesthetic experience entered the psychological discourse. The concept of aesthetic experience was never devised to denote substantive psychological entities, but resulted from a long and convoluted history of social culture and ideological transformations. However, these ideas permeated and crystallized as tacit assumptions in psychology and neuroscience. In consequence, psychologists and uh, uh, other scientists and philosophers treated aesthetic experience as if it defined a psychologically and neurobiologically meaningful class of experiences futurally seeking to identify their psychological essence. In other words, the fact that empirical aesthetics developed as an autonomous field led to believe that its object of study was also autonomous. But these beliefs are scientifically unsupported. What is more, they contradict a wealth of scientific evidence and historical fact. Aesthetic appreciation is not distinct from hedonic evaluation. On the contrary, as we have seen, concurring with the common currency hypothesis, aesthetic appreciation must be thought of as a fundamental neurobiological phenomenon, yielding elementary hedonic values for cultural objects such as art and music, but also food, sex, social behavior, and economic transactions. Substantial, substantial progress in cognitive science is possible, in my view, only if research on aesthetics is disentangled from research on art. Scowan and I, for example, define aesthetics as the study of how and why sensory stimuli acquire analytic value, which is the approach that I've taken uh, here. Under this definition, aesthetics becomes a fundamental topic for psychology and neuroscience because it links hedonics, which is the study of what hedonic valuation is in itself, and neuroeconomics, uh, which refers to the study of how hedonic values are integrated into decision making and behavioral control. These authors also propose that this definition of aesthetics leads to concrete empirical questions, such as how perceptual information comes to engage value signals in the world circuit, <clears throat> sorry, or why different psychological and neurobiological factors elicit different appreciation events for identical sensory objects. So why we like what we like. And this is a graphic depiction of this proposed place of aesthetics in psychology and neuroscience. Aesthetic is a scientific problem that can be defined as the aspect of sensory evaluation that refers specifically to understanding how and why perceptual representations of sensory stimuli lead to a given hedonic value. By defining aesthetics in this sense, empirical aesthetics and neuroaesthetics have a meaningful place in the context of modern psychology and neuroscience. Mm -hmm. Similarly, scholars like Braun and de Sanaike emphasize that the arts are more than aesthetics, considering their experiences, practices, and functions in different cultures and in different times. Both lines of in investigation point out the terminological problem inherent to art and aesthetics. So how art is defined has filled uncountable pages and debates in various fields. I would surely make it for another good seminar. But the problem of aesthetics, the problem that aesthetics um, entails to understanding greater peril, but also simple remedy. So what I suggest is discarding the term aesthetics, showing it once and for all. However, 
the issue transcends a mere terminological problem. As we have seen, the term aesthetics entails profound socio-political implications. Indeed, it has arguably been used as an instrument of power. And this is not surprising. In any normative system, the head of the matter is who holds the authority in defining the norm and how the norm is used. Still today, most curriculum art academies and conservatories are based on or limited to transferring canons. Whether classical or contemporary, more or less elitist, art education is to a considerable extent extrinsic. And even art creation often aims to fulfill the expectations of potential consumers or judges. So artistic value and the value are confounded, equated, entangled. How many curators have struggled with this? How many artistic careers have perished because of this? I'm not claiming that art should be unconstrained. And uh, paraphrasing Stavinsky's words in his uh, Poetics of Music, the stricter the constraints, the more creative the process. However, there's a difference between intrinsic and extrinsic constraints and motivations. And I here question the contribution of the latter. At the same time, it's often asserted that breaking conventions is a pursuit of is a pursuit or a purpose of art and the means for art progress. Throughout history, artists have been causing controversy, attempting to subvert the dominant structures in society and provoking people to see life differently. Many people claim that, after all, isn't the role of the artist to create new perspectives through their artworks? But I would say, as in any historical process, we find paradigm shifts that emerge from a flourish, that emerge from and flourish in particularly propitious environments. But now I'd rather emphasize the confluence of diverse artistic purposes, even if they don't usually intermingle. Different cultures, languages, solutions, and tastes are found in basically the same time and place, generating a huge artistic richness. Yet for it per but for a specific co coexistence to take place between all of them, the distinction between artistic and endemic value must be neat. And no particular taste should be proclaimed superior to others. And if time allows, I might introduce some actual music to illustrate this point later. So to conclude for now, in the interest of, of time, uh, just, just a brief note. I think that reflecting on this apparent paradox might also inform a fruitful debate on a topic that I find interesting from many perspectives and which I leave for future discussion. How to define and characterize art? What is art? So thank you so much. I want to express also my deepest gratitude to my collaborators, especially those with whom I've had the opportunity to discuss uh, these issues here on the, on the slide. And of course, thank you all for your attention. Thanks so much. Thank you so much, Anna, for uh, such a, a great presentation. I am sure there are a lot of questions already, uh, but I'll ask you to save them until the Q&A session. Uh, in the meantime, I'm glad to introduce our second speaker today, uh, who is uh, uh, Dr. Anne Birlman. Uh, she is a postdoctoral researcher at the Department of Computational Neuroscience at Max Planck Institute for Biological Cybernetics. Dr. Brillman's uh, doctoral work uh, focused uh, on understanding the experience of beauty. During her PhD, she also translated the first volume of Fechner's Preschool of Aesthetics, as apparently there was no official England translation for the book. She is currently working on the development of an experimental paradigm and a complementary computational model that could help us better understand how people make aesthetic choices based on sensory experiences. Uh, I'd like also to mention the Dr. Bilban's passion for drawing and comics, uh, um, which uh, you can also enjoy on our personal website. So uh, thank you very much for joining us today. Uh, we are very uh, happy to welcome you and please feel free to share your screen whenever you're ready. Thank you so much for the wonderful introduction, Nicole. I'm going to start sharing my screen. I do hope that you will see no, the full screen view in just about a second. If you could give me a brief yes, 
Yes. Because I can't see anyone. Yeah. Wonderful. Yeah. So um, as Anna did before me, and I couldn't have hoped for any better introduction of the topic and any better fellow discussant today, I'm also going to talk about predicting aesthetic experience. But I do want to take a slightly different spin on this topic and talk about this computational model of aesthetic valuation that could give us a precise quantitative tool to make such predictions of aesthetic experience with a fairly narrow focus on um, positive hedonic value. And I'd like to start beginning with that most of this work has been done together with um, Peter Ryan, my current uh, chef at the Max Planck Institute of uh, uh, Biological Cybernetics. So Anna has already talked about the differentiation between a normative tradition that claims that there are certain object properties that uh, everybody ought to find pleasurable or aesthetically valuable. And I do think that this normative tradition might still be able to explain some phenomena in our world and that especially media can exploit, such as the fact that most of us do enjoy looking at landscape photographs like these, most of us do enjoy the view of a kitten or a puppy on the internet, even if we don't want to admit it. And most of us do like uh, a good meal if it is well prepared, no matter the cuisine. However, I also wholeheartedly agree with Anna that this normative tradition is un utterly unable to explain a whole host of other uh, phenomena and likes especially uh, when it comes to artworks. Um, I think abstract art is one of the best cases that we have in experimental aesthetics to show that individual differences by far outweigh the um, shared taste between individuals. But just to give you some more contemporary um, or everyday life examples as well, I think there's also cases of, for example, tattoo art or the aforementioned comics that exist in several styles and traditions that are appalling to most viewers who are not accustomed to them, but very much liked and appreciated by others. So um, this phenomenon that the eye of the beholder is really fickle, so we are dealing with a lot of individual differences, has been really well documented in the literature, and I just want to acknowledge the work of many of my colleagues here briefly. So uh, Ed Vessel and colleagues have shown that this is true for a whole host of different visual stimuli and to different extents, with art being the one where really we cannot not explain more than 8% in, by means of commonalities and the uh, vast majority of judgments are really individual. Um, Martinez and colleagues have shown that this effect also does not vanish over time, so you cannot just accustom people to objects and then hope that their tastes are eventually going to uh, converge. Um, and of course, I also want to acknowledge Anna's amazing work on this, showing that there's a breadth of individual sensibilities to certain object properties that is starting to tap into the mechanisms behind these individual differences. So, the mechanisms behind these individual differences are my personal glimmer of hope in this otherwise for a natural scientist pretty dark um, outlook of everything's just individual taste. So what I'm going to argue is that yes, the after beholder is fickle, but I do think it's also predictable. But only if, for one, we're not only looking at the influence of object properties as a universal, but as a function of the individual observer. And then if we do find a suitable set of object properties, not just any that we can pick up easily with some MATLAB function that are relevant to the current objects of interest, then I believe we can find a predictive function for aesthetic judgments. Um, if we do acknowledge the interaction between object and individual observer. That is exactly what I'm trying to do together with Peter in my work right now in developing a computational model of aesthetic value. And I'm going to give you a conceptual overview of the model and I hope I'm not going too much into the nitty gritty details. But I think you will appreciate that it actually brings together a whole host of tradition of research in machine learning, reward learning, vision science and empirical aesthetics. So what we need, really, really need for a computational model, and I think any good scientific theory, is the question of the computational goal that a certain signal 
um, in this case, aesthetic enjoyment or um, hedonic value serves. And the big question here is, so why is it that sensory experiences are valuable to us at all? And we believe sensory experiences are valuable because they serve as a signal for our improvement of the sensory um, system. So the deep underlying goal is that what we want to do with our senses is we want to perceive and predict the world well. In uh, computational terms, we call it the good generative model. The vision scientists among you might appreciate the fact that this actually dates far, far back to Helmholtz's idea that perception is a sort of mental representation of the object that most likely causes the sensory input. So it's like this mini model of the world in our head, really. And what this model wants to do is it wants to capture the statistics of the sensory environment. So toning it down to mathematical terms, it wants to have a good probability density distribution of the features of the objects in the outside world. So I'm going to use these little one dimensional toy illustrations, but you, if you can, you may very well imagine this in two, uh, in th two three, four, five, a hundred D. So what we think our sensory system is, is it has these probability distributions ready for um, certain object features. And here's a toy example. I'm just taking the fur length of a dog. And the sensory system stores the probability of a uh, given fur length, uh, of the, all these different fur lengths. And for any given object that we experience, there's a readout of the probability of the value of that feature the object has. And now, with regard to value, what is valuable then in that sense is what is probable because sensory value serves as an indicator of progress towards the goal of having a good sensory system. So if the objects we experience are predicted to be probable, that means that our sensory system is working well, we have a good model of the world. Um, those of you coming from uh, empirical aesthetics might know this notion approximately as a fluency kind of hypothesis. We call this um, aspect of aesthetic value immediate sensory reward because it's a direct readout of the thing we're experiencing right now and only the thing we're experiencing right now. However, we believe that the story is a little bit more complicated than that because it is highly unlikely that our perceptual system is in constantly the same state. That would be stupid and not appropriate. So what we believe is going on is that in addition of having this generative model, it also constantly adapts to the world around us in a way such that while we're looking at a certain object, our system state, our mo uh, perceptual model shifts such that the currently experienced object becomes more likely. And therewith, through learning, also more liked, only considering this one immediate sensory reward component. However, we still don't think that this is the whole story, because learning in itself should also be valuable. And to include that in our model, we are thinking of our perceptual system as actually containing not this uh, lo only this local model of the world right now, but also a second model depicted here on the right that represents the summary statistic of all past experiences and there was an expected true distribution of the properties of the sensory world in the long run. And what we believe also factors in into sensory evaluation, apart from the question of how good am I now at processing things, is how good am I uh, in comparison to what I'm expecting to experience in the long run future. So how good is my sensory system going to be about predicting and perceiving things in the future as well? And in the good old tradition of reward learning, we believe that what is valuable then about learning is how it changes the distance between the state of the perceptual system right now and the state of the world as we experience it in the long run. So long story short, what we really believe is going on when it comes to sensory value is that there's uh, two components to aesthetic or sensory evaluation. One of them is immediate sensory reward, and that just signals us you're good at processing the world right now, you're doing a fine job. 
The second component is a change in the expected future reward. And that signal is a little bit different. It signals us what you're looking at right now is going to help you to process the world better in the future. And only taken together, we believe that they make up the complete picture of what aesthetic valuation means, because only together can they serve as the right signal for making the sensory processing system efficient both now and in the long run future. Um, as a quick aside, though, um, what I find really fascinating about this is that um, this also builds one of the links that Anna mentioned empirical aesthetics and neuroaesthetics have, namely to the reward learning literature, where the exact same kind of structure of weighing both reward now and expected reward in the future um, is being used, for instance, to predict uh, momentary changes in mood or happiness. So um, I want to give you a quick interim summary before going on um, and summarize the model as one that says that aesthetic value is really derived from the task of developing an efficient sensory system. And it has these two linked components, immediate sensory reward and a change in expected future reward. And both really crucially depend on learning because the change of our generative system over time is really what changes both immediate reward and um, expected future reward. Crucially now, in this model, aesthetic value is always a product of an interaction of object properties and observer characteristics. So these probability density distributions, these um, generative models are unique to every given individual because they are formed through experience. However, they in and by themselves cannot generate value. They only generate value with respect to the properties of the object that is currently experienced. And so there's there are both components in there kind of calling out for, for the need to look both at the individual as well as the environment. With this model, what we believe we can do is something that I believe not many have attempted so far, and that is exactly do this prediction of aesthetic value judgments, not across participants on an average and not even across several ratings of a given individual, but really on a trial by trial basis. So really predicting at every given moment in time, how much do you like the thing you're looking at or listening to? Um, and we do that by um, accounting for difference between individual observers via this idiosyncratic underlying model structure. And those are primarily contained in the um, current system states or the current state of the observer's generative model perceptual system, as well as the expected true future distribution that reflects the past history of the individual observer. On a quick aside, I don't think I'm uh, going to go into too much detail today, but please feel free to ask about it. We think that we can predict changes in aesthetic evalu evaluation over time really well with this model via the learning component. So this has now been a little bit technical. Um, similar to Anna, I want to go a bit more on the speculative side towards the end. Um, and give you some implications of the model as a mechanistic explanation of where individual aesthetic valuations come from. This is not set in stone. We have not had the chance to do experiments on this, but I think those are the implications. So to reiterate, both systems, both uh, the current model of the world as well as this long-term representations are a reflection of the observer's past experiences. And so by association, also her expected future ones. What this means is that these models reflect differences potentially in what has been available in the environment or is available in the environment of the observer. And these environments are obviously shaped by the culture, the socioeconomic status and other factors that determine what the kinds of experiences are that are available to us. Being available, though, is not the only thing that can influence what we experience. The other part of that is what the person is predisposed to seek out, right? So um, personality and expertise do influence the things that we 
uh, actively approach or avoid. And so what I think this invites us to think about is really what is here the, the conjunction between one's past um, experiences, shaping how we experience the present, and then in turn influence what we are going to seek out for the future. And our models like kind of makes predictions in either ways. I also think that our model links really nicely to the one that Anna has just introduced before, in that we have an aspect of perception in here, which is the current state of the perceptual system. We have a notion of task demands of what has been experienced previously, what is available from memory and is expected true distribution. And we have a very strong aspect in it of interoception, of a comparison process between what is now and what will be that might be mediated by dopamine, by the way. And that is the reward of learning is change in the value of the system state. So really, I'm almost a bit sorry that it can't be a bit con more controversial here, but I wholeheartedly agree with um, most of the things that Anna has said so far and just trying to give it this computational and quantitative spin here. The one thing, though, that remains a huge open question to me is whether or not this notion that I've just presented about aesthetic value is very much based in Baumgarten's old idea about what aesthetic means, just, you know, anything that is a sensory experience. So uh, you might have heard me saying sensory value and aesthetic value interchangeably. Um, I do think that our um, notion of aesthetic value applies to what most people do experience this aesthetic value in their everyday lives. So just to give you one example of a somewhat older study of mine, where we asked people whether beauty lies rather in art or rather in nature. And the overwhelming majority of people from several English speaking countries across the globe agreed that uh, the greatest beauty actually lies in nature rather than art. So I do believe that the everyday notion of hedonic aesthetic value is not one of art. And I don't make the claim that our model can account for um, these other artistic aesthetic values. Um, my open question to, to the panel, to Anna and to all of you is what then the purpose of art is now? Um, because apparently artistic valuation is distinct from this aesthetic valuation that is so deeply rooted in fashioning um, an effective sensory system. So what is art there for? And we might be a little bit cynic and say, well, looking at what's going on right now in the world with NFTs and artists like Banksy, maybe it's just about making money after all. Maybe it's just that the art world has created itself. But we need not look far and also see that there's artistic value to be found in happenings and in other forms of artistic impression that teach us lessons about the world and make us think in ways that beauty would never do. Hedonic value is something that we seek out because it is agreeable. Um, I would argue that artistic is, value is something that we seek out because it is not agreeable, but drives us further to think about ourselves and the world as it is right now. So with that rather sobering note, I'd like to thank you all for um, your attention, for indulging me for a bit. Uh, Peter, uh, that, who I already mentioned, my master's student, Max Biantek, who provided a lot of experimental data on the model that I just presented, the rest of my lab, as well as my funding agencies. Thank you very much, Anne, for uh, such a, a great talk. Thank you both, uh, our speakers. Um, we usually uh, open up the discussion uh, asking our speakers to comment or uh, ask a question to the other one. Uh, but um, we, uh, we also welcome uh, questions from the public. So if you would like to ask a question, just uh, uh, um, raise your virtual hand on the the reaction button. Uh, but uh, I, uh, perhaps we can uh, start with Anna. Uh, would you like to uh, comment or ask a question? Yeah, thanks so much. Uh, thanks so much, Anna, for, for this uh, great presentation. Um, I, I, I was a bit um, 
I'm not sure, but um, yeah, I, I wonder why do you say that uh, ethnic values um, may be agreeable and uh, artistic values not agreeable. I mean, if you look at traditions, you can see that in any tradition there's an agreement of what artistic value is within that tradition, whereas ethnic value is, um, as I said, um, a very variable even within one person. So the agreement is, uh, okay, uh, questionable at least, or very flexible. Yeah, I think you called me out here on not having, pro so I think the big question about artistic values, really contemporary artistic value, um, not in, in the history of what art has meant as a, uh, and provided in terms of function, um, to to humans and societies at large, I just think that the art term that we use right now is something that has actually come up quite recently and hasn't existed in this way, shape or form uh, for a very long time. I do not think that hedonic value in the sense that I presented it is any more or less predictable than artistic value, though. So I think there's actually as much disagreement in these everyday little hedonic values as there is in in artistic values um yeah i'm just not sure so i do believe we got we're starting to get a hang on this hedonic aesthetic value um that i do believe is agreeable because we actively seek it out right so i'm really talking about the the motivational aspect of it um not trying to belittle it um and meaning agreeable here really as like a motivational saliency thing whereas with artistic value i'm struggling to start to conceptualize but i'd love to start um what is the you know what is the computational goal here like where can we start asking those very same questions thanks thanks for the clarification so um maybe um a follow-up uh would be what do you think uh, could be the value of your model or how could be uh, of use for for the art world for artists Oh, I love that question. That That is really an interesting bit. So I think it could be really a really cool tool for artists to start understanding the feature spaces that they are working in, right? So um, I also went to art school for quite some time, did modern painting, and the huge challenge in abstract painting is starting to understand what you're looking for. And I think that when you you know, you, you get to have, say, an algorithm that you give classifications to on any sort of scale and then say, OK, now, based on what I gave you over a time course of, say, a week, extract for me the features that are important here and show me some visualization of what are what, what do these dimensions look like? And so I see it maybe as an exploration tool for for artists, really. If I may, I would like to ask you one question, though, about the, the last part of your talk, where you were talking about merging um, research and aesthetics, for example, with neuroeconomics. And I'm curious about that because I see a lot of anxiety when that is being mentioned in colleagues. And so a twofold question. Um, what can aesthetics bring to neuroeconomics that will make them want to listen to us and what could experimental aesthetics learn from neuroeconomics that would make us want to merge with them in a way yeah that, that's a great question um yeah as, as i said um so aesthetics in, in this is, can be defined as the aspect of sensory relation that uh, refers to understanding how these perception of representations and why lead to the hedonic valuation, whereas neuroeconomics is focused on the hedonic valuation itself. So um, how they are integrated to um, to basically motivate behavior, OK, and make decisions uh, about, um, well, considering uh, this uh, or based on, on this, this hedonic valuation. So um, the question here is that if they are, if uh, neuroeconomy is, is not interested in how um, stimulus features um, acquire this hedonic value, 
they are missing a very, very important part because it's just the adonic value, but they have and the, um, the uh, effect of this in the value. Uh, evaluation. So the um, the process of of integrating this as an equality, but they, they don't actually know where it comes from. And for us, it is important to see how this as an evaluation has an impact on the behavior of the individual. So I think uh, we should have a conversation. We should actually work together. And and I don't think I well I well actually I think that uh, most divisions in in science, as in uh, almost anything are uh, pretty much um, uh, artificial, right? So this, these categories are only um, uh, understandable or they make sense only if they are useful. And in this case, it might be, this case might be the case that, that uh, this distinction is, is not useful anymore. Maybe the, we, we should uh, become integrated. And it's as, as if, uh, well, maybe this is the opportunity. And uh, as I said, uh, because this uh, terminology is so um, so controversial or so problematic, maybe this is time for us to integrate within these these other disciplines which have uh, uh, maybe um, more established um, um, ways of of, um, of doing more more uh, yeah um, more established ways more established. Um, uh, methods and and um, uh, so I'm always looking for interdisciplinarity and transdisciplinarity. So I think it this might be one of the uh, best of the opportunities for us to uh, to mingle to to merge. I don't see a real distinction actually. If this uh, responds to your question. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, no, totally. And you do know that that I I agree with you absolutely. Just quick, quick comment. I don't don't want to keep anybody's. I'm almost afraid though that merging with neuroeconomics, what I'm seeing merging with machine learning is that we're we're going to go to a new normative tradition where now the question does not become anymore what ought one to find beautiful or appealing, but what is the most um, what is the most efficient, cost efficient or um, optimal to find appealing. It's just, just as an aside, I think we're going to have a nice conversation there with our colleagues at some time as well. Yeah, I just agree. I mean, uh, the problem here is that uh, if we think of uh, uh, scientific fields or artistic fields in, in very separate ways, and then uh, we um, are not actually um, we are disregarding very interesting questions that could be uh, enriching actually our own discipline, we are missing something very very important. So um, I, I think this is a very very reductionist um, perspective um, uh, in your economics, and I think. Uh, it, it could um, reach a, uh, uh, a, well, we could reach a better understanding of uh, how actually, because actually the main question is, um, or the main thing, the, the main purpose of uh, science or uh, quantitative science is, is, is to understand how we think, how we process information and how we make decisions and all this stuff. So um, any perspective, in my view, any perspective or any approach to this is valid and is um, uh, is enriching our own perspectives. So if what I'm saying actually is that we should merge, we should have um, um, we should um, uh, maybe collaborate, maybe just have conversations, uh, discuss together, just bring together our approaches and uh, create interdisciplinary, interdisciplinary and transdisciplinary new perspectives that could maybe um, generate or allow uh, better models of uh, the cognitive systems of cognition, human cognition, and also uh, artificial cognition, because what I'm saying, uh, sensory evaluation also uh, applies to, to um, non-organic systems, to artificial systems. So, um, and actually, <laughs> as I say that I'm, I'm working with uh, AI, um, um, engineers and um, we are trying to find this interdisciplinary uh, approach to cognition, uh, bringing together new science and AI, and uh, well, with the goal or aiming um, for a better understanding of both, and also uh, to develop uh, better AI systems that emulate better 
um, not organic uh, biological uh, cognitive systems and using AI to understand to better understand um, uh, yeah, biological uh, cognitive systems. So I think it's a question of, of summing up, not, not um, uh, uh, entering the limitations or being restricted by the limitations of another field. So it's just increasing the, uh, the, uh, the, the field, enriching the fields by merging them together, I think. Yes, thank you very much for such a great start of the conversation. Russell, I can see you're raising your hand. Would you like to pose your question? Yeah, <clears throat> fantastically interesting talks that you gave. I'm coming at this from a different point of view than you, and I'm, uh, you know, I'm a, a neophyte in this field. But it seems to me that one one thing that makes this field so interesting and simultaneously so complex is that the the Venn diagram that would describe the neural space in the brain that we would might label positive hedonic experience or pleasure is not identical to that which we would label positive aesthetic experience or aesthetic preferences. They're very related, but one is much more malleable and idiosyncratic, malleable over time, malleable between individuals. I mean, uh, let's say you might say, for example, that uh, food tastes uh, won't, haven't and couldn't evolve in the same way that artistic tastes evolved because of it's more biologically rooted. I mean, of course, it, there's always an expansion. I, throughout my entire life, I have experienced my aesthetic window expand in many domains in, 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 in experiencing music and experiencing tastes and so on. But, um, but they are not identical. So I think it would be very fruitful to think about what makes uh, the positive aesthetic experience unique rather than the same as or similar to the positive hedonic or pleasurable experiences. I mean, there's pleasure in sex, there's pleasure in, in food, there's pleasure in fragrances, but those are not the same as the pleasure of an unexpected spectacular sunset or um, you know, a piece of music by Bach um, or I mean, I, I've listened to music my whole life and I found that my musical bandwidth of acceptance angle has expanded throughout my lifetime. What music that I used to hate now gives me goosebumps and makes me cry. And, and in fact, thinking about this, think about the modern human being and what we have access to, I mean, just with YouTube, for God's sake, compared to someone in Mozart's time. We, we as humans can experience an enormous breadth of human artistic output and expression in ways that never were possible to, during our 40,000 year history of making art. And so in a way, I really think our brains have changed. And I bet I bet if you, we could do a fMRI on in Mozart's era, it would the parts of the brain that would light up would be, Different or smaller than today, because uh, I don't I don't think Mozart's acceptance angle could ever really um, accept uh, Schoenberg, for example. <laughs> Maybe he was pretty sophisticated, but you get the point. You know, just like in an individual's lifetime, your aesthetic, your ability to appreciate aesthetic things uh, expands over time. I think the entire human race especially now, has had an expansion of our, our what we can aesthetically accept as positive and inspirational. Do you want to go first, Anna, or should I? Sure. Yes. Okay. So, so let me be a bit controversial here and say, I don't see any reason why we should make a difference between the pleasures we get from sensory experiences and the pleasures. I mean, it's almost if if you want, it's almost all the sensory experience, right? The, um, we can also have a, 
a kind of pleasure from from abstract ideas. I think that's the only one that in that sense does not qualify as quote unquote aesthetic. But turning it down to just like the brain responses, even though we're having a horrible time neatly identifying what is associated with valuation per se, as opposed to very many other things that are associated with valuation, it doesn't seem like there's anything special you know, about, I always talk about, you know, chocolate cake is the same as Mona Lisa as far as our pleasure centers are concerned. Um, what I do think you're tapping into that I think is still a huge open question is what else but the pleasure comes together with the experiences of, of art or specifically, prototypically aesthetic sensory experiences. And that is what I think makes them qualitatively different. Uh, from the pleasure side, I think there's only quantitative differences really. Like people often don't call, like I've been doing a lot of research with beauty, right? So people often say, well, you can't call a coffee beautiful and et cetera, et cetera. Like there's things that just stereotypically yeah. don't seem to fall in the aesthetic category. But I think it's just a matter of intensity. Like I, I swear to God, my uh, one of the espressos I had when I visited Rome, it was beautiful. It was genuinely beautiful. It was the best espresso of my life. Um, but usually coffee doesn't get me there. And that's what I think. So I think there's the qualitative <laughs> difference that we're not getting at right now because there's other things, spot pleasure, that are really important in artistic experience. And then there's the quantitative difference. And that one, I think, is just that it so happens that most everyday sensory experiences don't qualify for the stuff, for the intensity that we experience yeah. in more artistic encounters often. So I think it's a twofold, but overall still a no. I still believe it's all the same. No, I don't think they're all the same. There's qualitative differences. And, and they because they go into the world of the human being to be able to be abstract, you know, like why, why is poetry in some ways more effective uh, and emotionally, aesthetically, than prose in many in many circumstances. It's not because they're not using the same elements of communication. It's because it taps into uh, different, uh, qualitatively different levels of of expansive association within one's human experience, one's individual experience. That, in some ways, the, the linearity of prose. Is uh, excesses less, or uh, why is it that um, when we hear uh, certain songs, uh, the lyrics written would not have the same impact as when you hear them attached to a melody? There's a, a, a there's an additional je ne sais quoi that's added. Yes, of course, they both involve activating hedonic elements of the nervous system. That I agree. So in that sense, there's a great overlap. But I think it's a fruitful exercise to try and pin down what is different, what is qualitatively different, not just quantitatively different, because you, it, it includes the other dimensions of human experience, which some of which are very abstract and very, very idiosyncratic. Thank you. Shall we give Anna also the chance to uh, comment if, if you like? Sure, uh, may, may I jump in? I was about to do that. <laughs> so, yeah, thanks so much. Yeah, this, this is very interesting um, topic, actually. Um, well, as I said, yeah, uh, art is more or maybe different uh, from aesthetics. And uh, I would go beyond that and I would say that, uh, well, there's nothing that she, uh, that uh, deserves the, the, the term aesthetics, as I said. This is an invention. This is nothing in the near majority of, of humans or any other organism that um that qualifies uh, for a different category called aesthetics that said um uh, well there there are the different um topics uh, that you've been um uh, like uh, mentioning and uh, i would like to just uh, to just to kind of uh, um, just to drop some comments on on some of them so um yeah uh the pleasure that we get in, in chocolate and the pleasure that we get in uh, having sex is exactly, in neurobiological terms, exactly the same as the one that we can get in uh, listening to Mozart or that, or um, looking at uh, some uh, artwork that we like or um, having an experience with a sunset, any natural uh, phenomenon. Um, and actually, uh, 
the quant well the quantitative the, the quantitative difference uh, perhaps shows that um, well perhaps benefits the natural the natural scenes the natural phenomena against or versus the uh, the artificial phenomena the artworks uh, so for example uh, people are uh, uh, very uh, Consistently reported, uh, reporting that uh, they feel um, stronger emotions when they are confronted with um, with non-artistic phenomena or with non-artistic objects than when they are confronted with artistic objects. But uh, this is again a very very personal and a very uh, contextualized, situated um, effect. Um, Maybe I can show you something that could be of your interest um, regarding what you said about Mozart. So I don't think our neurobiology has changed so much um, in recent years, actually, and even in centuries or millennia. Uh, our cognitive system in neurobiological terms, uh, in our, our neurobiology is, is pretty much the same. But I, I'd like to show you something that could be could be interesting. Uh, so I, I'm going to share my screen if you want. Just um, three uh, musical examples. OK. So uh, just a second. Sorry, I need to. Okay, and so I'm I'm gonna just say my my screen and that's all. I think this should work. Um, oh, sorry. Uh, uh, sorry. I, maybe I have to share my screen again. Yes, we can't see your screen at the moment. <laughs> yeah. Sorry about it. So, you now you can see the screen. Yeah. Okay. So, what? Oh. So this is the thing. Lang Lang. Yeah. So this is one example. Uh, sorry, I had to um, cut down. This is the same piece. Well, the same conversation. And then we have another version of the same composition.
Okay, I think I think you get the point, right? So these are representing different tastes. These are representing different uh, cultures, we could say, musical cultures. But the same, the very same piece. This is uh, this, uh, written in, uh, if, not, if you're not mistaken, in 1783. This is still very much played today. This is very famous. Uh, many people get a pleasure with it. And these are very, very, very different uh, versions, very different interpretations of, of it. So the best one could be the most um, uh, conventional in modern, in modern terms. So this is Langla playing on a modern piano. The second one could be the more the closest to the original intentions of Mozart, of the composer, and also the closest to the uh, to the expectations of the uh, of the audience at the time. So maybe maybe you've uh, heard some uh, extraneous uh, noise. This is not extraneous noise. This is uh, this is actually the original piano. This is an original uh, pianoforte. Um, and uh, you have to think that this piece uh, was composed in a time where, when uh, people in Vienna were very, very afraid of Turk, of, of the Turkish uh, Empire, the, the Turkish invasion. Uh, it was is very, uh, very scary for them. So this piece is uh, kind of trying to emulate these uh, war times, right? And I think maybe the second one. Uh, gets a more convincing effect of uh, in this direction than the first one even though the, fir the, the first one Lang Langs, is um, perhaps the preferred and uh, more um, appreciated nowadays and then we get Volodos um, Volodos own version uh, or revision of this in which he tries uh, kind of uh, translate the original intentions into um, into a language uh, that could be more approachable, more understandable to modern, to um, contemporary uh, audience. And this, uh, this is this is interesting to me because it, it brings us a lot of a lot of different questions. So, for example, first, what, why are we playing? What, why are we still? Yeah, why are we still playing people who, um, who are yeah, uh, for centuries, why we are still playing, uh, I don't know, Shakespeare, why are we still playing Bach, why are we still um, revisiting all of these people? Maybe because they are tapping into, um, into phenomena, into things, into thoughts that are very, very present nowadays. But the approach that um, performance and, uh, well, yeah, performance of, of any kind uh, bring when they um, when they're trying to visit these uh, these pieces is what actually makes a difference uh, difference here. And for people in different contexts, with uh, for people with different um, backgrounds, each of these approaches might be more pleasurable, more understandable. Even though the um, the underlying um, piece, uh, the underlying composition, the underlying text is the same. Good right? point. And also uh, regarding what you say about poetry, this is very interesting, and this is very much related, but uh, related to to uh, Anne's uh, model. So in poetry, like in music. Um, uh, the, uh, the the yeah, the authors, the, the composers are very much playing with expectation, with with semantic, I would say, with semantic um, surprise within stylistically or syntactically um, plausible um, contexts, right? In poetry. We get more surprise than in prose generally. Well, we think expectations, right? That uh, we might call this uh, poetic prose. <laughs> One of the sort of uh, uh, surprises in this in this regard, and this is actually what we get in in music. So we enjoy uh, surprises, but surprises that are not uh, very far away. They're not uh, uh, breaking through. 
in a sense, right? So this yeah. is, 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 is this interplay which makes uh, the, the things possible. So this is the language that they are that they are managing. And this is something that um, that holds now <laughs> and that hold uh, that held uh, centuries ago and millennia ago. So we are doing the same things actually, but playing with different uh, maybe with different um, styles. But the, the 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 underlying mechanisms are still the same. Excellent points. I, since I have to go to a doctor's appointment in a little while, could I just leave you with one thought that I think will be very provocative? And that is this. All the things that you've said about how you how you conceptualize the aesthetic experience versus or its overlap with or distinction from uh, sensory hedonic experience. Um, would all of your ideas apply to a pair of chimpanzees sitting on the shore looking at the sunset? In other words, we know animals, and, and let's stick, stick to primates, experience pleasure in many dimensions, in many extremes. But I don't think they experience aesthetic bliss, if you will, like we do. You know, you, I mean, one chimpanzee is not going to say, wow, man, have you ever seen a sunset like that? What a sunset. That's, that's, exactly, that's, that's a special sorry. one. <laughs> Thank you, Russell. This is definitely something we'll think about, but we also have uh, a limited time now, so perhaps I can see that Marina has her hand raised, and uh, would you like to pose your question? Yes, thank you. Thank you very much for raising this interesting question about hedonic value in general and hedonic value in art. I was just, I'm not a specialist in reward processing, but as far as I know, um, reward processing related to food, for example, or sex is not the same, although it overlaps, but it's not the same as reward processing, social reward processing. Because, for example, social motivation theory assumes that in autism, in people with autism, um, while hedonic reward system is, there are no differences between people with and without autism, there are differences in social reward system processing. So. I think whether art is related to social reward processing, and this can be why it is a bit special compared to just hedonic processing in general, because uh, I once also had a cup of coffee in Rome, which was delicious, but I didn't take it as a message. It was just a, a pleasure. Uh, although in Rome, sometimes they make pictures like they send messages in a cup of coffee. But in general, we don't um, perceive it as an act of communication when we just enjoy a cup of coffee. But when I am observing, when I'm listening to music, in a way, this has elements of social interaction. When people describe music, they say it is sad or it is like miserable or happy. And the same, we have a tendency to say the same thing about a cinema like this cinema is depressive or the cinema is like we give we uh, um attribute intentions because we know that art was created by people unlike sunset which we know it sunset is not a message it wasn't created by someone or if we don't believe in god of course um but art we we usually know it was created by other people and this gives it this sense of social reward side of it um, I wonder if this can partly explain why hedonic value of art is a bit different compared to hedonic value of a cup of coffee. Um, I wonder what you think about this. Thank you. Would you like to start? Yeah, okay. go ahead, Anna, if you want to go first. All right, Ken, oh. because I have a bit of data on this, and I'm really excited that I have directly oh. related data. It always makes me happy. Um, so we also asked people whether they, um, in the study where I showed that people say, you know, beauty lies in, in nature rather than art, we also asked them about the communicative properties, and um, we asked them about the memories of intense beauty and whether they were with anybody else, and there does really seem to be this uh, social factor in there. So people think that it has a communicative element, and people generally are with other people when they experience beauty and they do want to share beauty um so as this like stereotypical positive hedonic sensory evaluation signal i'm just saying that this was particular to beauty um though i think that the brain the neurological side and maybe anna can say something more about this because i believe she's an even greater expert than i could be is that the picture is a bit more complicated so i don't know whether in kids with autism 
the story goes that a social cl clue, even if a social clue cannot activate a reward network, the question is like where, like where in the pipeline do things go wrong? Is there maybe no connection to a certain brain region that could transfer the input to the reward network? That's what we see in music anhedonia, right? It's not the question that the reward, that there's no separate reward quote unquote center. I'm very careful with these terms for music. But there is specific music anhedonia because the connection between the generalized reward network and the auditory cortex is, um, yeah, that, let's say dysfunctional, like weakened in, in any way, shape or form. And maybe that could also be behind that. So I don't think that the argument of there being only partial overlap and then there being conditions where the same reward network is not activated suffice to say that there's distinct reward circuitry in these cases. But I do think that uh, the social aspect of these experiences has so far been a bit underrated. I'm still also underrating it myself and I think it would be really cool to do more work on that. Yeah, um, maybe I should say something else. I'm not an expert in autism, but um... What I understand is that um, in most cases, there's uh, well, the brains of um, people in this uh, in the in the spectrum are quite different from neurotypes in the sense that they have um, stronger and richer connectivity within areas, within regions, but poorer connectivity between regions. So this is what makes, uh, for example, social interactions so. Um, much difficult or more difficult than than for neotypes. So this is one point. Um, our brains are different. I mean, uh, any brain is is unique. is is very very different. This is one point. And the other point is uh, that well, I don't think why there should be anything particularly special in art about the concept of art itself. And I think the concept of art is, is really an invention. Uh, you know, there are cultures in which uh, there's no notion of art at all. I mean, then there's nothing special. There's, there's no particular um, category for this, right? It's just a communicative, uh, connective, a connective, communicative, uh, sorry, communicative um, act, and that's all. So it's like speaking. There's no difference between uh, speaking and singing. They they just communicate this way, and there's no difference between um, uh, being together, having a coffee, or being dancing together because the social act is is there. I mean, so I I would say that in some way that I've been reflecting on um, this um, lack of a neurobiological or you know, yeah yes and uh, psychological entity that uh, we deserve the name aesthetics, maybe we need to revise the notion of art and, and its implications or the assumption that it, it's related to uh, neurobiological or psychological meaningful entity that applies to any human. And this links to the comment uh, before about the distinction between anim non-human animals and, and humans. Well, in my view, in my perspective, there's there's no difference. There's there's just uh, maybe a quantitative um, uh, difference. Uh, our brains are different again. We have different experiences. We have, we have different cultures, but uh, there's nothing that makes us uh, special. And maybe there's nothing that makes art special. Maybe there's mm, no special, meaningful, neuro, in, in, I'm, I'm always talking in, in neurobiological and psychological terms. There's nothing sp uh, special about art. Thank you both. Thank you. Thank you both. And perhaps I'm aware we only have five minutes left to wrap up our meeting. Perhaps I'll just like to uh, just add a little bit of shade uh, of grey and uh, um, say that I, I agree with you with um, the fact that from a neurobiological point of view, rewarding experience, positive experiences are very comparable. Though, sure, 
they feel different from an, um, a phenomenological point of view. Drinking a great coffee in Rome, eating a <laughs> chocolate or visiting a museum. Uh, I, I myself visited a few weeks ago. Uh, I saw for the first time um, uh, an artwork uh, um, by um, Francis Bacon uh, and I was completely moved and really blown away by finding myself in front of this artwork. And so from a phenomenological point of view, sure, these things do feel different. And perhaps what I I would like to, to ask your, your thoughts uh, is that perhaps hedonic experience uh, it is not always positively connotated um because sometimes and there is the concept of the sublime in nature sometimes even if there are experiences that are extremely beautiful and extremely powerful and extremely pleasurable then sometimes this can overwhelm and uh, have kind of negative con connotations um so i guess yes i wanted i wanted to have your thoughts on uh, what what do you think about uh, yeah, about this and about the fact that from a phenomenological point of view, those experiences do feel different and how as scientists should, we should take into account uh, these phenomenological differences. You like to start, Anne? I'm John mind either way. I feel like I have started with all the questions, so I'd rather give you the word first. <laughs> Let's just go ahead. Yeah. Okay, fair. Um, I think you make a great point. I especially, you know, your your experience in front of, of Francis Bacon uh, had a very similar thing um, going on. First time standing on a full size Pollock, whom I never understood. I was always like, well, why does anybody want anything with that? Um, and I'm not sure whether, you know, that is still in the realm of the hedonic. So the hedonic almost per definition is just considered concerned with the pleasure and that's not belittling all the other things uh, that are going on I just do think that they belong almost to a different realm of experiences um, for instance including something like the sublime and I, I could you know try and shove it into my model because we have this you know, it has this component of there's this immediate sensory reward and that's really pleasurable and it's telling you everything's fine, but then there's this learning component. And that has a lot to do with novelty and curiosity and interest and being challenged and seeking out something that is beneficial only in the long run, meaning also it might not be pleasurable in, in that one certain sense right now. And I think that might be the best scientific handle that I have to, to these experiences that are in the very first moment not necessarily pleasurable and yet draw our attention and yet want to be experienced and draw us in and we do seek them out it is in in those we seek challenge and and novelty and, and interestingness not so much pleasure but that somehow this is also makes part of the mix what makes up um sensory evaluation that's the best i can do that I still feel like we have to talk way, way more with artists and philosophers to get to, to the ground of what's in there in addition. I don't think we're the utmost expert there. I think our colleagues have figured out more about this already. Yes, thank you very much. Anna, would you like to comment? Yeah, just, just a little bit for English more, please. Um, um, yeah, I, yeah, I agree with him. Um, I would say that um, negative, exp uh, well, um, pleasurable art or the, um, the uh, experience of uh, negatively negatively valence objects might be pleasurable, actually because they, um, yeah, as you said, uh, they um, allow learning, but also because they are they have they are just powerful. I mean, in phenomenological terms, I mean, we we just get moved somehow, right? We get uh, away from our um, whatever context in in the sense that uh, we are like um, transported somehow phenomenologically 
that we feel trans and transported into, into different world, into different mood, they are telling us something. There's a communication there. And, and in, in any case, uh, if there's a communication, and in, in a, a, and whenever there's so what I mean is whenever there's a communication and whenever there's uh, learning, this can be experienced. This can be experienced as pleasurable. So there's an intrinsic pleasure in learning, and there's an intrinsic pleasure in the, in the communicative act. So that's why it might be explaining these negative experiences or uh, the experiences, the pleasurable experiences, maybe even with negative art. And in regarding to your question, which is a very, very interesting and broad one is, um, why do we feel this like um, phenomenologically um, uh, different, distinct? I think this is a very, very cultural phenomenon that we, that we feel it different because it happens to us, but it doesn't happen to other people in other cultures. So we might need to look at this question from a cultural or English um, perspective. That that's my my point. Thank you. Thank you very much both for such an amazing conversation, Marina. I'll uh, give you the words so you can wrap up the meeting. Yes, thank you, everyone. I just want to remind you that our next seminar will be next Wednesday. Aesthetics of the built environment architecture with Abhishek Shemesh and Uta Leonis. Hope to see you all there next week. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Owen. I'm going to stop the recording now. Thank Bye. you. Bye.